I was wondering what that ringing was going to be, and it was actually ringing, so that's good. <laughs> uh, welcome. My name is Casey Gay. I am originally from West Virginia, so if you would detect a little bit of an accent, that is not your imagination. That is from the South. Um, it looks like we have a few announcements, but before that, I'd just like to say that I am a MDiv. I just graduated from seminary about a year ago. Um, I'm seeking ordination in the United Church of Christ, and I'm really happy to be with you here today. So thank you for the opportunity and the welcome. Um, the only thing I'll mention, I think, is the, the month of August is this congregation's turn to provide volunteers to deliver meals to our Mount Vernon neighbors. Um, and we are asked to pick up the meals at Southeast Lynn Community Center in Lisbon around 11.15 and deliver them, usually four to five people, uh, then return the empty trays and insulated bag to Southeast Lynn. So I think I'll just bring attention to that. And does anybody else have any announcements or anything they would like to bring to everyone's attention this morning?
Is it on? Yep. <laughs> Good morning. It's time for another church directory. It's been almost nine years, if you can believe that, and there's been lots of changes. It's being done by Life Touch. The photo shoots are August 17th, which is a Friday, and it starts at 2 in the afternoon, runs till uh, 9 at night. And then on Saturday, the 18th, it's 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, Life Touch makes it simple to reserve your session. You can do it online through Facebook and the church website, or you can do it with um, anyone who's down at the table, the Life Touch table, after the next uh, after church the next several Sundays. I'll be down there today if you want to sign up or you have any questions. Um, they've chosen Carmel as the background color, so keep that in mind when you decide what to wear. There's a neat pamphlet down there on um, giving advice for uh, how to dress and um, what looks the best. Um, also on the table is uh, pricing sheets for prints, which is fairly new, so that you don't get sticker shock and you might be thinking of giving photos for gifts or even uh, Christmas greeting cards. And um, if you bring a donation on the day of your photo shoot for Mount Vernon Schools, you get $5 off your order. Um, so come downstairs today and look at the information, and I'll be glad to sign you up. Thanks. Anybody else? And also, thank you to Reverend Nancy for helping me out today. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we'll be doing this together. Um, the Lord be with you. And now let us please rise as we share in our morning's call to worship. At God's table of justice, everyone has a place and none are turned away. Here. At God's table of abundance, a banquet of righteousness and liberation is set for all. At God's table of life, all peoples know peace and creation flourishes. Here the hopeless are nourished with possibility the complacent are transformed into advocates for change. Here in our very midst, the kingdom of God is revealed.
And now as a community of Cape Grace, we come before God's throne of grace, offering our prayers of confession. Let us join together in our prayer of reconciliation. We confess, O oh God, that we have experienced despair as we look at what is happening around us, feeling overwhelmed by the need and stymied about what can be done to help. In our anxiety, we have hesitated to share our gifts with others, tempted to hoard what we have, or believing what we have to offer is not enough. See us as you saw Hagar in the wilderness. Help us to see those who have been cast out, forced to forge their own way without home or community. Open our hearts so we may invite all of God's children in. Teach us this lesson. When we submit to the miracle of faith, what we have and who we are is more than enough to create blessing and new possibility. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God's grace is abundant. God's love is never-ending. Friends, the gospel affirms this. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Sarah, Abraham's wife, was unable to have children. Abraham's wife Sarah took her Egyptian servant Hagar and gave her to her husband. He slept with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when she realized that she was pregnant, she no longer respected her mistress. Sarah complained to Abraham, but he told Sarah she had to deal with Hagar. So Sarah began to treat Hagar so harshly that Hagar fled. The Lord's messenger found Hagar at a spring in the desert, the spring on the road to Shur, and said, Hagar. Sarah's servant, why did you come from, and where are you going? She said, from Sarah, my mistress, I'm running away. The Lord's messenger said to her, go back to your mistress, put up with her harsh treatment of you. Then the Lord's messenger continued saying, I will give you many children, so many they can't be counted. You are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You will name him Ishmael, because the Lord has heard about your harsh treatment. He will be a wild mule of a man. He will fight everyone, and they will fight him. And he will live at odds with all his relatives. Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her, the God that sees. And she said, Can I still see after he saw me? For many believed in those days to be seen by God was to die. Hagar returned to Sarah and Abram and gave birth to Ishmael. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks thanks be be to to God. God. Now I would like to invite the children to come up and join me up here for a discovery time. How's everybody today? Having a good summer? 
Yeah. Um, how many of you have birthdays? Anybody here have a birthday? Never have a birthday? Yes. When is your birthday? October 10th. And what happens on your birthday? What What are you going to be? A year older. When's your birthday? October 27th. And how old will you be? I will be a year older. A year older. <laughs> and when's your birthday? Do you know? March 1st. March 1st. And you're going to be a year older on your birthday? You're going to be six. Oh, you're, you're young enough to tell us how old you are. And you? My birthday's four. And you won't tell us how old you are going to be? You're going to be 11. All right, so on your birthdays, everybody is going to be one year older. Does everybody have a birthday? Yeah, and does everybody ha get one year older on their birthday? Oh, yeah, that's right. All right, so this week, our country is celebrating a birthday. Do you know what day that is? Yeah. July 4th. July 4th. Do you know what year older our country is going to be? Guess. How, how old do you think it is? 2018. 2018. How about you? No, have a guess? Anybody have a guess? You have a guess? Well, what if I told you that last year our country was 241 years old? So, if we're a year older this year, then what would we be? Ha, your math is just exactly right. 242. Um, you know... The church has a birthday too. Did you know that? It wasn't too long ago that we celebrated the church's birthday. Do you remember when you had the pinwheels and everybody dressed in red? And that day is called Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church. Do you have any idea how old the big, not just this congregation, but the big old worldwide church, do you have any idea how old it is? It's really old. <laughs> well, more than 2,000 years old. That's a lot of candles, don't you think? Yeah. So, why do we have the 4th of July? What are we celebrating? You know? What are we celebrating about our country? When it first started, first we sort of belonged to this nation across the ocean called England. We didn't like that very much. We wanted to be free. And so the United States grew and grew and grew until it's the country that we have today. And so are you having a special plan for the 4th of July? Going on a road trip. Going on a road trip. All right. Are you going to see fireworks? Are you going to see fireworks? Maybe while we're driving. <laughs> Maybe while you're driving? Probably. Probably. And you're probably going to have burgers and brats and picnic stuff and uh, have a big, big celebration because we're so happy to be free. This morning, behind me, we have the communion table. And there isn't anything on there right now, but do you know what's going to be brought up to that table? Bread. Bread? And do you know what? Juice and wine, that's right. We're going to put them up there. And this table is to remind us, just like the 4th of July reminds us about our country, this table reminds us of who? Who gave us this table and this meal? Oh, come on. Who's always the answer at church? Jesus. It's always the answer. You can't go wrong with Jesus. Jesus gave us this table to remind us that we are his and we belong to him. So this is a celebration that we have every so often. And it's a way to remember how important Jesus is in our lives because he loves us, he cares for us, and he helps us be the people that God wants us to be. So I hope you have a wonderful 4th of July. And let's pray before you go back to your places. Dear God, we thank you for 
your presence in our lives. We pray that our celebrations will be safe and fun. And we pray that when we come to your table this morning that you would fill us with your spirit and remind us that you are our Savior and you love us completely. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Now I'm hungry. We could all just go get some hamburgers. And... I don't know how Pastor Lori would feel about that if she came back and said, uh, we all went out for hamburgers. <laughs> Woman, slave, mother, wife, Egyptian, namer of God, Hagar, wife of Abraham, given to him by Sarah, slave or maidservant of Sarah from the land of Egypt. Hagar never asked to be a mother or a wife. Hagar never asked to be part of the family dysfunction in Genesis. Hagar is often forgotten in our houses of worship, not because she has no relationship to God, but she gets overshadowed by Sarah and Abraham. We do not see her because she's just a prop in the real story. We feel sympathy for Sarah, who cannot bear a child, but do we feel sympathy for Hagar? We are taught that Hagar's attitude after becoming pregnant is reason enough for Sarah's abuse. Hagar did not choose to lie with Abraham, but she does choose to run. Freedom, what the 4th of July celebrates, freedom. This fleeing Egyptian makes a choice which will lead her to freedom or death. Her only escape route is through the wilderness, the dry, barren, brambly wilderness with a plethora of dangerous creatures and a dearth of drinkable water. Why did she run away? Some of us may understand completely why she ran away because we have had to run from a situation or a person. Can you see her? Splashing water on her face, sipping water from her palm. What was she thinking in this moment? Did she think of going home to Egypt? Was there a tribe who would help her, take her in? Perhaps if she was a man or was with a man. The desert was full of nomad tribes, peoples traveling from place to place, hunting and trading. We can imagine cities made up of makeshift cloth tents, usually around a source of water. All who lived in the desert knew that death was just around the corner. That is why hospitality was the greatest held virtue. Strangers lost in the desert or in need were viewed as potential guests, not as potential threats. But Hagar was a woman. A woman without a man, a piece of property without an owner. Hagar cannot look to other human beings. She doesn't even look to heaven. She does not attempt to find God. But God finds Hagar. Hagar, slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? God knows Hagar's name. Sarah and Abraham never call her by name. But God does. I'm running away from my mistress Sarah, God tells Hagar, to return to Sarah, to return to an abusive situation. But where else could she go? She has no shelter, no food, no protection. She is like many victims of abuse. She has been trapped in a bad circumstance with no resource to aid her escape. The desert may mean death, but there is no guarantee of survival at home. God reassures Hagar with a promise. A promise of a son, Ishmael, who will be free like a wild donkey. 
not only free, but resourceful and strong, capable of surviving the wilderness. Ishmael's ability to be hostile against a hostile world is good news. Her son will fight against oppression. Woman, slave, mother, wife, Egyptian, namer of God, Hagar. Hagar names God the God who sees. So Hagar will return to her difficult life as a slave, as a surrogate. But God sees her. God is with her. I never heard of Hagar my entire time growing up in the Christian church. I only learned about her in a womanist theology course. Womanist theology explores scripture through a lens which is intended to empower and liberate African American women in America. Hagar may have been unknown to me, but as Dolores Williams explains in her book, Sisters in the Wilderness, no other biblical image could have been more appropriate than Hagar in the wilderness for representing the African American past and present. In the two accounts of her story in Genesis, Hagar goes into the wilderness. In the first account, Hagar is still a slave. In her pain and misery, she meets her God for the first time. Her experience with this God could be regarded as positive by African Americans because God promises survival, freedom, and nationhood for Hagar's progeny. The African American community has all of its life struggled for survival, freedom, and nationhood. In the second Genesis account, Hagar is again in the wilderness. She and her child are no longer slaves, but their freedom has brought them into dire economic straits, just as freedom brought severe economic consequences to newly freed slaves. Life, like African American people, Hagar and her child are alone without resources for survival. Hagar must try to make a living in the wide, wide world for herself and her child. This was also the task of many African American women and the entire community of black freed people when emancipation came. Hagar's story has two parts and we can learn from each part of her story. We can learn from her initial escape into the wilderness that God may see us, God may be with us, but God may not immediately free us from a horrible situation. We do not have to be African American or black to understand the metaphor of wilderness. We have all suffered hardships and loss. We have all felt God's absence in a situation of turmoil. Hagar and Ishmael will have to create a home in the wilderness because Sarah throws them out. She worries Ishmael will take Isaac's place. So she wants Abraham to get rid of the person that's standing in the way of her son, Isaac. She wants to secure her son's inheritance and her son's livelihood. We in this society often make choices that secure our own health and well-being at the expense of a oppressed group. We can be angry with Sarah for following the traditions of her time, but I think we're better served when we recognize in ourselves part of Sarah, the part of us that is willing to toss out other people in order to benefit ourselves. We learn from the second part of Hagar's story that God loves the outcast, even if human beings do not. Hagar's story reminds us that God sees us in our suffering. God is with us in our suffering. When human beings turn against us, cast us out, see us as less than human, God sees our humanity and worth. We may be like Hagar, stumbling in the wilderness of depression, of illness, of loss. We may not be searching for God, but God finds us. Or we may find ourselves alone and isolated in a wilderness created by a situation or a person. Will we remember the story of Hagar? Will we remember God is not just the God of the civilized and the landscaped, but also the God of the wilderness? 
We don't have to look far into history to see Hagar in the desert with her child. All we have to do is turn on the news. We can see women in the desert facing the same choices that Hagar faced. Freedom or death? Or is it freedom and death? Hagar cannot return to Abraham and Sarah. Sarah makes it clear that she wants this slave girl and her son out of their lives for good. No one will take Hagar and Ishmael in. They will receive no hospitality. Their lives have no value. She has no value without a husband. We can hear the people asking now the way that Sarah did. What can this girl do for me? What can refugees do for us? They have no skills. They have no ability to make money. Didn't Jesus say, love your neighbor who has money as yourself? (laughs) Hagar does not ask to be saved. She doesn't hope to survive. She just prays that she won't have to see her son die. She just doesn't want to see her son suffer. Can you hear the echo of this story at our borders? Hagar is a throwaway woman by society's standards. Hagar is the mother who survived thousands of miles in the desert to seek safety at our borders, only to find she is leaving one wilderness and entering another. Isolated by language barriers, by the way people view brown skin, by the lack of love, compassion, and hospitality in people's hearts. Hagar represents the woman of color, fearful for her son's survival, not because he is in the desert heat, not because he can't find water, but because in the wilderness of America, she has to worry her son will be hunted down and shot and then portrayed as a criminal. Hagar represents mothers I know in West Virginia, abandoned by husbands who are addicted to pills. Addicted to pills because there's no work and there hasn't been any work since the coal mine closed down and there's not going to be any work. So these mothers work three jobs, four jobs. They do their best to survive. Even if we cast out Hagar's, like Sarah and Abraham, God sees the Hagars among us. God promises Hagar that her son, Ishmael, will be the father of a great nation. God opens Hagar's eyes and she sees a well of water, life-giving, life-saving water. And Ishmael is saved. And just like a wild donkey of a man, he learns to hunt. He learns to love the wilderness. He learns to survive. He is free, and so is Hagar. She made it through her wilderness event. She can now find Ishmael a wife in Egypt. She can now think about future. A future where she and Ishmael are not enslaved and do not need any other tribe. For God is with the boy and with Hagar. Hagar shows a radical faith in a loving God in the face of human contempt and love and hate. Woman, slave, mother, wife, Egyptian, namer of God, Hagar. Dolores Williams argues God's presence does not always liberate. Sometimes it just helps us survive until we have a better quality of life. We may feel we are in the wilderness right now. We look around us and see violence, hatred, division. We see hopeless situation after hopeless situation. And we cry out, God, free us from this mess. But God may not liberate us from this human created mess. But God will help us survive. And we must survive. We must not give up. We must trust that God is with us 
And we may not see the fruits of our labor. Our ancestors who were enslaved and who enslaved, they're not here to see an America where slavery is illegal. Hagar didn't survive to see the generations after her, the Ishmaelites and the Hagarites, be administrators in King David's court. She didn't get to see that. We may not see an America where all people are viewed as children of God, where all churches have rainbow steps that welcome people in. We may not get to see that America. But let us be like Hagar. Let us have radical faith. Faith that God sees us and faith that God's will will prevail. Amen.
this table spread in our midst today does not belong to First Presbyterian Church of Mount Vernon, Iowa. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And Jesus invites all who profess faith in him to come and join in the meal that he has prepared. In this congregation, it's a tradition to celebrate communion with intinction. We have both grape juice and wine. The wine is in the white cups and the, the grape juice is in the dark cups. So, grape juice, gray, wine, white. Got it? All right. I do, I do too, I think, now. Um, as, as you come to receive the sacrament, you come down the center aisles, take a bread. Bread will be given to you, and you dip it in the cup and take it, and then return to your seats through the, the side aisles. So let us celebrate this meal. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, if you have much faith and if you have little. If you have been here often and if you have not been here for a long time. If you have tried to follow and if you feel you have failed. Come, not because it is I who invite you. It is our Lord. It is his will that those who want to should meet him here. And if you'll join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Gratitude, praise, hearts lifted high. Voices full and joyful, these you deserve, most holy God. For when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name and no future, you called us your children. When we were lost, our way, our turned away, you did not abandon us. When we came back to you, your arms opened wide and welcome. And look, you prepare a table for us offering not just bread, not just wine, but your very self, so that we may be filled, forgiven, healed, blessed, and made new again. You are worth all our pain and all our praise. So now, in gratitude, we join our voices to those of the church on earth and in heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. For us you were born. For us you healed, preached, taught, and showed the way to heaven. For us you were crucified, and for us, after death, you rose again. Lord Jesus Christ, present with us now, for all that you have done, for all that you have promised, what have we to offer? Our hands are empty. Our hearts are sometimes full of wrong things. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs from under your table, but with you is mercy and the power to change us. So as we do in this place what you did in an upstairs room, send down your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine that they may become for us your body, healing, forgiving, and making us whole so that we may become for you your body, loving and caring in the world until your kingdom comes. And hear us now as we pray for people and situations known to us. We lift up to you, O oh God, today, those who are dealing with severe medical conditions, those who are healing from surgery, those who need your healing spirit to come into their lives. We pray for those who are grieving, we ask that you would hold them close to your heart, giving them comfort and a sense of peace. We pray for people who are poor, for those who are destitute, for those who are awaiting 
a new land in which to make their home. We pray for the places in this world where there is violence, injustice, strife, and poverty. Send your spirit to build up your community so that where your servants are, there will your peace and justice be. Remind us always, O oh God, that you love us deeply and completely, and that through your spirit, nothing is impossible. And now, together, let us share the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Among friends gathered around the table, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Later, he took the cup and said, This is a new relationship with God made possible through my death. Take it and remember me. He whom the universe could not contain is present to us in this bread. He who redeemed us and called us by name now meets us in the cup. So take this bread and this cup. In them God comes to us so that we may come to God. doesn't have much in it.
Christ who has nourished us is our peace. Strangers and friends, male and female, old and young, he has broken down the barriers to bind us to him and to each other. Having tasted his goodness, let us share his peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace. Thank you.